to be reduced to principal, or you will walk away. See, you'll walk away. Okay, now let's look at uh, Romans 619. I mean, I I feel like I'm a little kid in a field with all these like sacred cows going tink, 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 tink. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so Romans 619. We're going to read it out of uh, the um, New King James. And then, and I know I got it in my notes, but there's just nothing like, you know, a Bible, which is a book, and which is obviously I like books by yeah. the millions that are on the table. Okay, so in uh, Romans 619, uh, it says, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members, members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Okay, now let me read it in the Passion. I've used the familiar terms of a servant and a master to compensate for your weakness to understand. Okay, stop. When most people say, I speak in human human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, what do most people think when they hear the word flesh? Body. Mm -mm. Sinful. Sinful. Y'all yeah. oh. don't, because I've been training you for years. Yeah, see? It's foreign, huh? It's foreign. You're like, well, the body. Nope. Most Christians, when they hear the word flesh, they think of the sinful nature. Yep. That you're fighting a sinful nature on the inside of you. Yep. That's not the case, right? Because it's been crucified. So the passion brings it out. I'm speaking to you in familiar terms because of your weakness to understand. He's referring to the intellect as well as the soul. The soul was not yet at an area to grasp the truth that Paul was trying to convey, so he reduced it in terms of slave and master. So then he says, For just as you surrendered your bodies and souls to impurity and lawlessness, which only brought more lawlessness into your lives, so now surrender yourselves as servants of righteousness, which brings you deeper into true holiness. See, holiness is like a vast ocean where there's no bottom, and you can just jump in and explore. And remember, when you jump into the ocean of holiness, what are you exploring? His beauty. You're being captivated. It's like he turns and you see him again, you're like, oh, oh, I didn't know you were so beautiful in that area. And then you turn, you're like, ah, you're just so great. I mean, that's what it's like. You're just like, you're absolutely gorgeous, Father. Every time I turn around, I get to see another aspect of your beauty. That's what happens. So when you present yourselves surrendered to righteousness, the reality of who you already are, the more you do that, the more you see His beauty. And what's happening? Your eyes are getting off yourself. Which is the best thing that can happen for some of us. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, when we start getting navel-gazy and introspective and blah, blah, what are we doing? We're no longer on ourselves. I mean, on Him. So you, be, you become what you behold, right? I think it's really interesting to hear people. Oh, like, we'll just use the Grand Canyon for an example. Oh, it's overrated. And I'm thinking, I've heard this. And I'm thinking, well, then what perspective are you thinking of? Right, as? right. A hole in the ground or a really a creation of, you know, something that God has created. Yeah. And it's, yeah, I think. Too much, uh, I don't know. Netflix or something. I don't well, know yeah. what's well, happening. Well, there wasn't a slide to slide down or something for them to do, you know. All the do the ability to it. pause and behold exactly. something so magnificent is being lost. Exactly. And I, that's exactly my point. Right. Is that some people go and they look and it's like, oh yeah, no big deal. And it's like... Because it's not the adrenaline rush exactly. that people are wanting. I mean, exactly. just every... Oh, my phone's right there. I was about to grab my phone. Let's put this in my phone. <laughs> Every ding on your phone is a dopamine rush. That's what happens. Every, every time you get a text, every time you get an email, every vibration or notification, every ding on your phone is a dopamine uh, rush. People self-interrupt now. It's a lost art to lay it aside and just sit in the presence of majesty. It's a lost art to go outside and notice the birds. Like we got those little, uh, we decide they're bar barn sw swallows. Oh, barn swallows. They're they so neat, little scissor tails. Anyway, I was watching it this morning because every day I get up and I want to see what they're doing and how much they built their nest. And so I saw one of them, he had a little ball of mud in his mouth and he's carrying it and stuffing it in his little nest. <laughs> so you know? Cool. Yeah, just taking a moment 
to enjoy nature, you know. And, and then my just read this, some people think they're nuisances. I mean, oh, yeah. I could see they when they dive bomb their head, <laughs> yeah. that they're annoying. Because but the to babies, me, all the babies so will come also. And yes. after you get a few generations, <laughs> you've got over and over. poop everywhere. <laughs> we'll have to try to set them up in other space. <laughs> and we'll expand our house so they can find other areas. Get them a litter box. <laughs> get them a litter box. <laughs> but, yeah. but my friend Cindy, she had them, and she loved it. I remember when she lived here, she absolutely loved it. And I remember the little babies, the little boy heads out, wanting some foods. Okay, let's see here. I'll just wear a hat, and ha a hat outside. <laughs> now, the outside. word presented in this verse means to make something available to someone without necessarily involving actual change of ownership. Okay, just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness leading to lawlessness, now present your members as slaves of righteousness. So the word presented means to make yourself available to someone without necessarily involving a change of ownership. In other words, make yourself available and present yourself to someone or something. In other words, you're saying, here I am, either to uncleanness and lawlessness or righteousness for holiness. Now, when I study, the Lord will say, look up that word, right? I'll be like, do, 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 and he'll be like, hey, I want you to look up that word. He said, I want you to look up the word for. For? <laughs> well, I think I kind of know what that is, you know? But I'm like, okay, because it says, as slaves of righteousness for holiness. So I looked it up, and it means for the purpose of. So the very first definition of purpose at dictionary.com is the reason for which something exists or is done, made, used, etc. I'm going to put it all together. Okay, slaves means to be completely controlled by someone or something. So we are to present ourselves to be completely controlled by righteousness because holiness or being set apart to God is why we exist. You were designed to be holy. See, people think they were designed to be sinners. No. God never intended for us to be sinners. He literally designed us for holiness. Or, if holiness is the beauty of God on display, He designed us to display the beauty of the Lord. Isn't that neat? Okay, let's read verse 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Now, that's interesting. The uh, Passion says that when we were servants to sin, we were free from any obligation to righteousness. Why? Because we weren't holy. We were created in the image of our father, the devil. We looked like him. So free means independent. In other words, we were independent of righteousness because we were only made righteous when we were born again. And He made us that righteousness. He imparted His to us. Now we are dependent on His righteousness, not our own because it's His filthy rags. So just like holiness is apart from what we do, so is righteousness. And just like we are to order our thoughts, emotions, and behavior within the sphere of already being holy, we're also to order our thoughts, emotions, and behavior within the sphere of already being righteous. See, I love that. It takes all the guesswork out. <laughs> it's like Proverbs, the Holy yes, Proverbs, like when it says, you know, blah, blah, you're like, hey, that's mine. That's mine because I'm already righteous. That's me. Yeah, it's amazing. Reading the Old Testament through the eyes of already being righteous and holy uh, gives a whole new perspective. You can see Jesus a lot easier because the Old Testament is a ministry of death. Why did God have to wipe out entire people groups? Because if He didn't, they were going to corrupt the entire earth again and He made a promise not to flood it. You see what I mean? Like There was no remedy for sin. There was no remedy. The only remedy was once a year, the people of God would do the Day of Atonement and offer the sacrifice, right? But even then, the priests had to have little bells on them and a, a, a rope to pull Him out in case He misstepped. Because they had the fallen nature. 
That's why when people say, well, I'm a good person, no, no, no. It has nothing to do with goodness. It has to do with whose nature do you carry. And I guarantee you ain't getting into heaven with the devil's nature. You must be born again. Okay? And so that's why that's so important. And it takes me to our last part. He may bear his holy arm. All right, so let's look at Isaiah 52. I think for too long the church has tried to bring the ministry of death into the new covenant. You know, and you can't do it. There is no death except for Jesus Christ in the new covenant. And he's been resurrected. Okay? So in uh, Isaiah 52:10 it says the Lord has made his holy uh, has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of the Lord. Now I want you to picture this. Let's picture you know, the father. He's got his long robe, right? And he looks down and he's known for a long time but he sees we're helpless. We have no way to save ourselves. No way. So he rolls up the sleeve of his robe. And he's like, okay, it's time for me to step in. I'm going to handle this. See, that's what happened. So what did he do? He became man. God alone could save us. He became man. And then he lifted up Jesus on the cross for all the nations to see. Right? And we know that's a fact because all the nations were in Jerusalem that weekend because it was Passover. So all the Jews from all the different nations, I think they said it swelled to what, six million people? Oh, a lot. It was a huge number of people were in that town. And they heard of this Jesus that was crucified. Some of them may even went by and saw him on the cross. Now in Luke 3, 6, they quoted this, All flesh shall see the salvation of God. Jesus Christ is the salvation of God to all nations. <clears throat> now the phrase, may bear his holy arm, means revealed his power. The power of God made God into man to take our place and our punishment in order to give us who believe His own holy nature. No man on the planet would have been able to accomplish this because again, holiness is a state of being, not doing. So the Holy One had to become man so that we could become holy ones. So He came down and He rescued us Himself. Now let's flip back to Isaiah 35. Uh, verse 8. It's one of my favorite. Isaiah 35 is a very prophetic uh, chapter. It's a really good chapter for today. In fact, um, I've got notes here. Applies to Clovis. Got things, you know, highlighted here. It says in verse 8, A highway shall be there and a road, and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks this road, although a fool, will not go astray. Okay, so highway is a path traveled. It's also in the Hebrew a pattern of life, the obedient life, the righteous life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, according to John 14, 6. No one comes to the Father except through me. The word way in the Greek is a highway. Okay, so he is the highway. He is the highway of holiness. In other words, we're not going to be saved um, uh, or be able to come to the Father unless we go through the highway or the way of Jesus Christ. There are not a bunch of ways. Not all ways lead to the same destination. Uh, Buddhism is not the same as being a believer. Islam is not the same as being a believer. You know, none of those. Being Catholic is not the same as being a believer. If you think just because you belong to a Catholic church, you're going to heaven, you got another thing coming. Because the only way you go to heaven is believing in Jesus Christ that He was God as man, died, rose again on the third day, and is now seated in heavenly places, right? So it doesn't matter if you're Baptist, Church of Christ, Catholic. I've met people that have sat in uh, denominational churches and probably even some spirit-filled churches that weren't saved for 30-something years. It's not going to church that makes you saved. And then when people are like, well, where do you go to church? Myself. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. yeah, I tell them, yeah. But, but the idea is it's not religion, it's relationship. And even if I have found the most religious people in spirit filled churches, and I have in even the Nazarene. No offense, Nazarenes. But you know what I mean? 
Spirit-filled Christians get a little bit too big for their britches, thinking they're all that in a bag of chips. Okay, so Isaiah 62, 12. And they shall call them the holy people. Why? The redeemed of the Lord. And you shall be called sought out a city not forsaken. And then over in 48. Like Isaiah is full of Jesus. I mean absolutely brimming. Thus says the Lord your Redeemer, Redeemer, verse 17, the Holy One of Israel, I, the Lord your God, who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way you should go. Uh, the word teach means to instruct, train, prod, goad, teach, to cause someone to learn. The origin of the verb may be traced to the goading of cat cattle. Sim similarly, teaching and learning are attained through a great variety of goading by memorable, uh, memorable events, techniques, or lessons. It's very interesting. In fact, the year I was born was the year of the teacher. 1973, Lamad. Okay, um, so the way we should go is holiness. The Lord redeemed us to holiness. He started us on our way. And we should continue the course by being obedient to His commands, starting with loving Him and others as we do ourselves, and then the daily things He teaches us, the experiences, all those things that He gives us. All right, let's finish up. Uh, in Hebrews, and I wanted to give you all a lot of Scripture. I mean, I literally did a word search for holy, and then had to, I had to categorize them into different aspects of it. <laughs> that first study, I'm like, ah, I, mean, I didn't even know where to start. Okay. Hebrews 9, 8. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing. Okay, so remember when Adam and Eve fell, what happened? The tree of life had to be guarded. The way to the tree of life had to be guarded. So he sent a cherubim, actually two probably at least, because cherubim is uh, plural. But he sent cherubim to guard the way to the tree of life. If Adam and Eve would have eaten the tree of life after the knowledge of good and evil, we would have been eternally condemned. Yeah. There would have been no remedy. And so he had to guard the way, and we know that Jesus is the way. Now, in uh, uh, chapter 7, verse 26... For such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. And I don't want to turn there, but in Romans 6.22 it says, But now, having been set free from sin, and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. Now this is interesting. We have fruit to holiness. Because we've been set free from sin. Not that we must work to be free from sin, but we're already free. So it's like we're just, we got this basket called holiness and we're just adding fruit to it. You know, we're already holy. So it's not like we're working for. See, it would have been uh, you're working for or to earn holiness. You already got it. So your fruit is just, again, ad attributed to holiness. And then 2 Corinthians 6. I do want to... I turn here. I wish more churches, and I know God's going to do a revival of this, but I sincerely believe if more churches would get out of the nonsense that you're still fighting a sinful nature, that you're not holy, you're not righteous yet, all of those things, they'll say you are positionally. They'll say that, but that you're actually already uh, I wish more churches would teach that because I think we could actually wrap this thing up pretty quickly. Yeah. I do. Mm -hmm. And so there's going to be a revival of the kingdom. And uh, and this will be its message. So it says in verse, starting in verse 16, we'll go to 7-1. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, now what's the therefore? Because he, we're in a temple, right? 
Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. Where are we perfecting holiness? In our soul. Okay? So he's saying, again, if you don't know that presence makes you holy, you will read this as if you're not yet. But if you understand, he's saying, you're already my temple. It is impossible. If I heard any Christian say, well, even though I'm God's temple, I'm not holy, I'd be like, what the heck are you talking about? Wherever he is, he's holy. So because he already dwells in us, it's already been fulfilled, he's now saying, don't be a part of profanity. Don't be a part of unholiness. You're no longer that person. Present yourself because you were literally put on the planet to display holiness and to be holy. So that does not mean that you're not to be around sinners. He said if, if, though, if that was the way Paul wrote, then you'd have to be caught up into heaven. He's saying, now get this, don't be around Christians that do these things. Separate yourself from Christians that do specific things. And if you want to know what they are, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So that's where it's like, okay, you're doing this and this because you don't understand you're already made righteous, you're already made holy. You have an identity issue here, a self-love issue. Let's get into that. Let's solve that problem. If you refuse to re repent, there will be a separation. I'm not going to allow myself to be around someone that's living unholy. Okay, So it's a very interesting uh, idea. So let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness, filthiness of the flesh. What is he talking about? The soul. So we're now holy. We're not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers in marriage. And we're also not to be unequally yoked with Christians that are sinning uh, specific ways. We're to be separate, meaning absolutely separate from all evil. Now, there is an implication in this text that he's actually talking about sexual impurity. Okay, so if you look at it, you'll see that. Uh, and, like we learned with the word mercy in the Old, Old Testament where it means loyal love, get, get this. The Greek word for holy also implies loyalty to God. Isn't that interesting? Remember that shock? Yeah, Gigi, you're inviting a person to church when I preached yep. on loyal love and all that. Yeah. Ooh, goodness. Oh, mm -mm. <laughs> that was a crazy day. All right. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. 2 Timothy 1, 9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose of, or, and grace, which was given to us in Christ before the world began. So we have been chosen to be holy. According to Ephesians 1, 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. See, I love that. We were chosen to be holy. Romans eleven sixteen. For if the first fruit is holy, the lump's holy. If the root's holy, so are the branches. And did he say we're branches? Yeah. I'm just, I want this in you. Mm -hmm. Our root okay. system is holy. So as we allow the work of holiness to permeate our soul through the renewing of our mind, we will possess hearts established in holiness. 1 Thessalonians 3.13 So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father the coming Lord Jesus. See, when you live from that place of holiness, you feel blameless. See, it's really hard to pray for somebody to release healing or resurrect the dead if you don't feel blameless. Your conscience will condemn you. So you can't have faith. So the best thing you can do is come to the conclusion you're already holy and live that way that way, when you pray for someone, there's nothing blocking. See, you don't want your heart to condemn you in the middle of raising somebody from the dead. That can be a problem. <laughs> Romans 12, 1 through 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, 
but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God directs us to pursue holiness, according to Hebrews 12, 14. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Hebrews 12, 10. For they indeed for a few days chastened us to seem best to them, but he for our profit. Why? So that we can be sharers of his holiness. Now, chastening is so that we can uh, share it in its fullness that is coming. We know that all things will be dissolved away, and, and, and His return should always be in our perspective on the decisions we make. Second Peter 3.11, Therefore, since all these things will be uh, dissolved, what manner of persons ought you be in holy conduct and godliness? Colossians 1.22, In the body of His flesh or death, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. And finally, 1 Thessalonians 3.13, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So all of this must be from a place of holiness due to presence, not works. But you see what's going on here. You being holy is not the end game. It is the start of the transformation. You know, I think we always think of salvation as the end. Oh, I'm saved. I'm not going to hell. Praise God. No. Salvation is the start. And so as your soul is renewed to the realities of salvation, at the end, when He comes, there will be no shame. You know, you'll see Him and you're blameless. But notice that holiness and blameless go hand in hand. That's very important. And I think that, again, the more people come to the realization that they're already holy, the more they'll walk in blameless lives. And you know, one thing that I think the enemy also tries to do to us is he tries to condemn us with our personality. Mm -hmm. We need to be careful with that. Because, you know, just because my personality is a certain way doesn't mean I should be ashamed of it, but it does mean it needs to be filtered through holiness, righteousness, love, all of those things. But I think he's like, well, you're too quiet. You should be more bold. Or you're too bold. You should be more quiet. Or uh, you shouldn't say that because that's blah, blah, blah. Well, maybe you should say something because you never do. I mean, you can see. He just, he'll, he'll mess with your head because of how you're designed. So probably the best thing you can do is the next time he says, well, you're too quiet, say, well, you're not. <laughs> maybe you should go wherever you crawled out from and be quiet. You know. But anyway, just celebrate. I think if, if holiness is displaying the beauty of the Lord and he meticulously and perfectly fashion you, right? Then you should celebrate the beauty He's given you. And then recognize your personality constraints. Recognize soul wounding and soul mindsets that need to be renewed so that your personality becomes such a reflection of His beauty that you'll never again say, I should be this or I should be that. Comparison will kill holiness quicker than probably anything else. Because it's all about it. Anyway, ooh, whoa, sorry. <laughs> My foot just moved the thing. Is that neat? Isn't this neat? I love it. It gets better and better, I promise. <laughs> so let's pray. Father, we thank you that you manifest your arm, your strength, and you brought salvation to us. No man did. No man had anything to contribute to the saving of themselves. We are absolutely dependent on righteousness. We are absolutely dependent on the work you did and the salvation that you brought in your own effort apart from anything that we could do. And so, in fact, not only could we not save ourselves, we actually hated you and you still died for us for the joy set before you. And so all the temptation that you endured was because of us. The separation from your Father on the cross was for us. All the beating, being spit upon, your beard ripped out, everything that happened to you, being nailed to the cross, everything was a display of the strength of your arm. And so we thank you for that. And we ask, Father, that if there's one thing we never forget, it's that we are holy and that is who we are now. It is our identity. It is displaying your beauty. And I ask that you, Father, just take us uh, on a journey of exploring the depths of holiness, that we go deeper and deeper. We pursue it because when we're pursuing holiness, we're pursuing your beauty. And when we pursue your beauty, we're pursuing you. 
So I ask, Father, that you surprise us, shock us with your beauty, that we turn around and we see this aspect of you and we're like, what? I never saw that before. And then, Father, help us that when we see that aspect of your glory, that aspect of your beauty, that aspect of your holiness, we say, that's mine because you've made me holy. Your nature is in me. Father, I ask that you erase the separation there, that we don't separate ourselves from what you show us, but instead we take ownership of that as that is who I am now. So, Father, we thank you for this. Father, right now, we want to give our tithes and offerings to you in the beauty of holiness. No law, no rule, no regulation, but in presence, we give our tithes and offerings to you this morning. We ask, Father, that Jesus Christ receive them in heaven, and we sanctify the 90% or the 80% or the 70% that's left from our giving. We, we sanctify it and set it apart as holy for your work. So we thank you for that. We give you honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Holy.